from last year. Um, we've got our pictures. We are the leaders of this program. And as you can see, we have a nursing program manager. We've hired someone, but they haven't quite started yet, so we can't reveal who it is. So uh, it's a big secret until Monday. Um, but we do have a manager, a program manager, who is a forensic nurse who is going to help, help us lead this program, implement this program, and she will be one of the main contacts for you um, as a consultant and we'll be working with everyone so that we can schedule the on-call, schedule trainings, and make sure that each one of the consultants has everything that they need uh, in order to be able to do the job and to help uh, other hospitals work through the medical forensic exam. With TextTrack, there are a lot of collaborators with this, as you can see. Um, we have grant funding through the Office of the Victims of Crime uh, to help us bring this program up and going. We have funding through the Texas Office of the Attorney Generals, uh, who was uh, legislatively mandated to set this program up in Texas. We are working closely with TASA to uh, identify areas that may need assistance with advocacy and, and are pulling those advocates in and educating them about text track, telehealth, and how everything works so how they can best work with um, their survivors uh, when we're all together in the same room, either in person or virtually. Uh, the International Association of Forensic Nurses is our technical assistance provider on the OVC grant, which has been really exciting because we have been able to connect with other programs that have telenursing services and we're able to take the best of what they have to offer and the best of what Texas has to offer so we can make, of course, the best program ever. Um, we have an advisory board that's helping us and our advisory board consists of a survivor, we have um, the Attorney General's Office. We have forensic nurses on our board. We have attorneys. We have both prosecution and defense. Um, we have our, um, our engineering group who's helping us build a, gr a great uh, new equipment that's going to be put into the hospitals so that, um, so that we can remote in and be able to see the entire examination. You guys, it's gonna be really exciting. And we have our uh, Advent GX, who is our company who is building software for us that's specifically designed for telenursing it with medical forensic exams. It's gonna be really cool when, it, when you guys get to see this. It's, it's all, I'm really excited about it. And then of course we have our expert sayings, which are gonna be you know, nurses from around the state who wanna participate and consult and work with us. And so it's just a huge team effort and we're so excited about this. Uh, this is just another chart to show there's so many people involved. Um, it's taking really the entire state to help bring this program up and we're so excited about it. Um, and you guys, uh, we thank you so much for your interest and we're just so happy that, you know, that you just want to be a part of this because really this is improving and increasing access to care to people who may not normally get access to care for a medical forensic exam. And this is going to change the face of how we address sexual assault in the state of Texas. Um, I could tell you the governor's office is really excited about this um, through the Sexual Assault Survivors Task Force. And I know Jenny's on that task force. And we've had discussions about telenursing and telehealth and how it's just going to impact um, how we take care of patients. And you guys are on the ground floor and it's just so exciting. So as we, we talked about, there's access to care. That's the, one of the biggest issues. Uh, many hospitals in Texas lack access to sexual assault nurses. We all know that, right? We cover, many of our programs cover three, four, five, ten 10 counties. There may be no hospitals. Patients have to drive hours and hours in some places um, to just get to a place where there is a qualified and trained forensic nurse, a sexual assault nurse examiner, to be able to provide care. And we provide the highest standard of care. We provide that highest level of care because we are so we're specially trained to address the unique needs of this patient population. We're seeing uh, patients that are being transferred to safe, ready facilities. We've had some challenges with that, right? We all know that, and I'm sure we all have tales that we can tell 
about you know some of the unintended consequences of Senate Bill 1191 and some of the uh, challenges that we've run into with patients either being transferred to us or tra patients being transferred long distances and bypassing forensic nursing uh, facilities and or programs such as you know freestanding facilities that can't even that are not even able to be listed as a safe ready facility so that the community can know so there's a lot of challenges with that and we're hoping with telehealth that we'll be able to reduce or eliminate some of those challenges. We want to reduce the delay in uh, you know, time-sensitive medical treatment. We want to re uh, reduce, reduce any delays on, uh, for evidence collection. We want to make sure that the community and the support services there for that patient are, are better connected than what they have been in some of the rural locations. And we want to try and reduce the cost. Uh, that's always our goal, right, as healthcare. Is to, how can we reduce that cost but still provide that same high quality care? And I can tell you, I think text track and telehealth is going to be is, is going to be an answer to that, and that's our big strategy. Um, the 85th or 80, 86th Texas Legislature amended the Texas Health and Safety Code 33, uh, 323.0015, and it looked at the safe ready facility, and if it employs or contracts with a sexual assault forensic examiner or uses telemedicine system of sexual assault forensic examiners, then they're considered to be uh, safe ready. We want to increase that number of safe ready facilities so that any, any facility that a patient goes to could potentially be a safe ready facility. In the 86th legislature, Senate Bill 71 was really instrumental because this amended the, gover the government code, Chapter 420, and it, this actually established and said through the, that the Attorney General's office was responsible for establishing a statewide telehealth center for sexual assault medical forensic exams. And the purpose of that center was to provide training or technical assistance to SANES was to provide cons consultative services, guidance, or technical assistance to SANES, and to provide technical assistance or guidance to healthcare providers that are conducting forensic medical exams for sexual assault survivors. So it was a pretty comprehensive legislat uh, le le legislative package that went through uh, um, with this Senate bill. And we're really excited because it can help um, new forensic nurses, uh, forensic nurses in rural areas who maybe see two or three cases, you know, a month or every six months or you know, maybe 10 cases a year or if that, because, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it, you know, you kind of forget and to have someone coming in and say, hey, what about this or don't forget that or, you know, oh yeah, the new evidence says, you know, we need to swab this way. It's really nice to have somebody there to really boost, you know, and help you boost those skills and really just provide just a nice calming sense into that exam room. And we're really excited about this legislation. So what exactly is telehealth, if you didn't already know? I'm just going to go through this really quickly. But telehealth is really the use of electronic information and telecommunications technology to support long distance uh, health care, patient and professional health related education, public health and health administration. So we're using technology to communicate across long distances and to help healthcare providers just do their job better. And that's, you know, that's pretty it. That's pretty simple. And so it's face-to-face -face and it's live. It can be interactive video. Um, it does require a few things in order to be successful. You have to have reliable video conferencing. So you've got to have a great program. You've got to have some broadband internet, and we already know that maybe in some of the rural areas that might be a little challenging, but we're working with uh, our pilot sites uh, so that we can try and overcome some of those challenges. You've got to have effective communication skills with those with the people that you're interacting with um, and then encryption, of course, in, in this day and age with uh, information and it, that needs to be protected. We've got to make sure that the whole system from point A to point B is encrypted so that we don't have unintended uh, or uninvited guests like we started having with Zoom bombers when, when we went into hibernation with the pandemic. And of course, we've got to have business associate agreements with those, uh, with those facilities because we are talking about protected health information. We are interacting with patients. Um, while we're not providing absolute direct hands-on, I'm not touching a patient, I am in the same room with a patient and protected health information is being discussed. And so while telehealth is great, there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be built up around that. 
And that's what we have spent this last year doing is building that infrastructure so that when we're ready to go, all of these things are in place. So with our telehealth, you're gonna hear some, uh, some different uh, terms uh, throughout either this presentation and also if you come to work with us as a consultant, you're going to hear words like hub and spoke and we're like, what the heck does that mean? And really it's, it's the communication tree. Um, at the hub is going to be the local provider. So that's the expert um, who, and they're at the hub and the spokes, if you think of it like a wheel, that hub is going to provide education and, and consultation to different spokes around that wheel or different areas. So we could have a hub, which is going to be all of our, cons our consultants, and then we'll have the spokes, which are our sites who are receiving services and receiving that consultation. Um, we're really excited because we have several spokes already. We've got four and we're working on adding to that so we can, we can really enlarge that wheel. And as consultants, the, that consultant is considered to be the hub person. So that is the person who is providing the guidance and providing their expertise to the spoke site. So some of the basic principles, um, we are following uh, all telemedicine laws that are here in the state of Texas. So any the hub provider, which is our consultants, they must be licensed in the state where the patient is located. So where that spoke site is. And right now, fortunately, all of our spoke sites and all of our pilot sites are here in the state of Texas. And all of our hub nurses, all of our consultants will need to be licensed in the state of Texas. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't not see patients outside, uh, but we'll have to add them in, in phases if we choose to go that way. But right now we wanna focus on Texas. Informed consent is required. Um, the patient needs to know, just like with any other procedure, uh, they need to know what telehealth is, have an understanding that there's a person that's going to be there remotely that they can talk to, that they can have a conversation with, that's going to help guide that examination. And they must understand that they're talking to another person and that they're pro providing in, uh, details and protected health information. And so we have to get an informed consent with, with that. And our standard of care, it must be equivalent, right? If we're going to be providing that expertise and guidance, we need to make sure that we are meeting the standards of care, not only for telehealth and telemedicine services, but also for forensic nursing services uh, that we're provide, helping that site, the spoke site provide. And then we have to think about HIPAA and high tech. We've got to make sure that we're in compliant with both of those federal and state legis privacy laws as well. So here's where we are, TextTrack, the Telehealth uh, Forensic Remote Assistant Center. And we have two sources of funding, like I said, the first source is through the Office of the Attorney General and the second, for, uh, second source is through the Office of Victims of Crime through a federal grant. And the mission of TextTrack is to use trauma-informed model that focuses on the individual and promotes future health and well-being for all persons who experience sexual assault. TextTrack utilizes telehealth to provide continuous availability of high quality medical forensic exams, regardless of geography or community resources. And we felt that this was really important. Our advisory board, uh, which is multidisciplinary, we talked about this uh, for a very long time and we had meetings about the mission and what do we want this to look like? And this is what we came up with as our mission. Our purpose is to prevent issues related to transferring patients. Uh, we wanna be there, we want patients to stay in our communities. And we wanna be the ones to remote in to help those nurses in those communities provide the same level of care or uh, provide a, a better level of care for those patients so that they can get that same level that any other patient who requires a medical forensic exam will be able to get. We wanna reduce further trauma, trauma and promote healing. Um, you know, it is traumatic to transfer a patient from one facility to the next. And so we wanna reduce that trauma. We wanna improve evidence collection and documentation and then support that collaborative community response to sexual assault. And so it's, it's a hefty mission, but I think we can do it. So what is TextTrack going to provide? Uh, what kind of services are we going to provide? Well, we're going to provide 24 seven expert SANE guidance for medical forensic exams via telehealth. 
We are developing trauma-informed protocols and policies. We're helping our pilot sites, our spoke sites, develop policies and procedures uh, related to how to conduct that examination. We're helping them develop and put those things in place because several of our spoke sites do not have policies related to sexual assault and addressing and conducting the medical forensic exam. And so we're helping them do that. Uh, we want to develop easy to use state-of-the-art telehealth equipment. We're, we think we've got that. We're in the testing phases now of our new equipment. We're enhancing a, our simulation to pilot the program with standardized patients before we go live. So we have a fabulous simulation center and we're going to access and use that to, for just another aspect of, of training and, re, and refinement of the program. Uh, we're providing advocacy during the exams and community referrals for our pilot sites, as well as online uh, education and support of those healthcare providers through the use of Project ECHO. And, and Project ECHO is a really awesome program that was developed by the University of New Mexico, where education is uh, available to people all over the world and they can remote in and talk about case case studies and get a little bit of uh, additional education related to that case study and so that the information kind of echoes and that everyone in areas who need to have uh, or have questions uh, can, can have an opportunity to learn and so we're really excited about that we had our first project echo um, tell um, uh, session today with our pilot sites and it went really really well so again, here's our hub and spoke model. The consultant is the, the hub, and then we have our sites at the spokes. And this is hopefully what it's gonna look like when we add in our, um, our forensic nurses. So we have text track in the center, and out from that we have our hub nurses. And our hub nurses are the consultants who will be consulting from their home, and will be remoting in to our spoke sites and providing that guidance for the medical forensic exam. Uh, our pilot sites at this point, we have, let me tell you, I know where they are and if we can see them on the map. Hang on, I'm gonna use my cursor. So hopefully you can see we've got uh, Uvalde Medical Center in Uvalde. We have Valverde uh, Regional Medical Center in uh, Del Rio. And we have NAP Medical Center in Westlaco. And we are also adding uh, Doctors Hospital Renaissance in Edinburgh. And so, and then we're working, we're talking in talks with a couple of other places and hopefully we'll be able to continue to expand the number of sites. Uh, we really wanna hit those rural areas uh, that are in such need and, and, and can really benefit from an expert remoting in and helping their um, healthcare providers. So we are going to look at adult and adolescent exams initially. Um, we're um, confined uh, by the OVC grant of looking at uh, to providing care to adult and adolescents. And when that grant period ends, we will uh, look at transitioning potentially into the prepubertal pediatric population. Um, we're working with CAC of Texas. They are on board. They're part of the advisory group, our advisory board, and they're very excited about the telehealth potential. And we are also will have the presence of a survivor advocate during the exams, again, to provide that much needed support that our patients need. So here's kind of what the exam process is going to look like. We've got lots and lots of blocks, but we'll go through them. Um, and so I, I wanna make sure we've got plenty of time for your questions, because I know you guys are just dying to have questions. I just know it. Um, we're not seeing right. the next slide, Stacey, so. Huh? Here, uh, we're not seeing the next slide. Didn't move. Oh, it didn't do? This did this earlier with Zoom yeah, for me, yeah. and I have to stop sharing. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. We're gonna take a pause. Momentary break, everyone, while I mess with my thing here let me fix with this and try and get this fixed this did it to me earlier which was really annoying in a meeting and i apologize so let's see if we can do this now and from the current slide and hang on all right let's see if we can try this all right i'm going to try sharing my screen again and okay can you guys see my screen 
Somebody give me a yes. No. Me a yes. no. No? Okay. <laughs> I know, we had the same issue earlier. It's a Zoom thing. It's not even it is a Zoom thing. It drives yeah. me crazy. All right. Mine says it's loading, but it's not showing. Oh, okay. It's loading. All right. Well, it's not going to You can now. see if Stacy has that. I mean, if uh, Nancy has that, you could have her pull it up, and then you would just have to tell her to advance to the next slide when you're done talking about it. Oh, okay. Well, we could do just that. Just as a, as a backup. All right. We'll try it. Let me see. All right, let's try one more time. Can yeah. you guys, all right, let's give it a second to load. And you guys tell me if you can see it. We were almost through too. It's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Not yet. Technology's fabulous when it works, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, Nancy, then I'm gonna let you share your screen and then we will pick up on slide 22. Yeah. I am so sorry, I apologize. Ugh. <laughs> um, my problem is I'm having a different problem, which is when I go to full slide, you can't see it. So you can just see my slide version. And I want you to see the whole thing. So hang on, I'm gonna go back to here and try it live. Yes, and then I won't be able to see you guys. So you just tell me when to. I will yeah. tell you. I'll see you next right. time. Got it. Uh, not, not <laughs> no. yet. No, I still see the Brady Bunch for you. Okay, so all of Zoom is broken. All of Zoom is broken. Will you forward me the PowerPoint, Nancy, and I can try to share it on mine? Yeah, let me try you again. Any better luck, but you can certainly try because it says I'm sharing. Oh, there, there we there go. There it is. Yay. I see it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, all right sure i guess it did yeah so here all right let me see if i can hit slideshow and see if it can make it bigger no that didn't work either all right hang on let's go back down here i love technology oh here we go we'll back up one all right can everybody see yes, yes. all right success all right all right here's our exam process um we have up here at the top, the patient comes to the hospital, okay, and they are after being sexually assaulted and they are assigned a healthcare provider that gives them their options. They can either be transferred to a hospital with a SANE or they can have a, a telesane or a telehealth nurse uh, remote in and help guide that healthcare provider through the exam. If they choose to be transferred to a hospital, then of course they'll be transferred and the forensic nurse or the text track uh, program will not be activated. But if they decide, oh, I think I wanna stay here and I wanna have somebody uh, tell a remote in, then that's when the process began. And so the healthcare provider will contact the telesane or the telehealth nurse and will start to ball rolling, the healthcare provider will contact the advocate, they'll get consent, the expert will log into our site and we'll talk with the healthcare provider a little bit. We get a little bit of information so we know what's going on, you know, who the patient is, what did they prefer to be called, uh, what facility, or uh, what is the level of um, com uh, comfort that that healthcare provider has? Have they ever conducted a medical forensic exam before? Uh, or have they done a couple? And Or are they a SANE who just needs some help and some guidance here and there and they just want that extra, you know, that person remoted in just to, if they have a question. Um, so we'll get a little bit of information like that on the pre-encounter consultation. And then we'll go into move into the patient room and we actually get to meet the patient and talk with the patient and explain a little bit more about what is uh, the text track program and what is telehealth and how are we there, how is that expert consultant there to, um, to provide some guidance. And that exam is completed and then the patient is discharged. We know there's a lot more to that, but that's kind of our overview here. And, and then after the forensic nurse, uh, the healthcare provider and the expert will sit there and they will talk about how do they feel that exam went. Um, let's, make, let's get the documentation. They'll help them with that documentation piece. They'll help guide them through the evidence packaging. 
um, we'll get some feedback, you know, how do you think, how was the, you know, encounter, you know, how was it working with someone on that end remote who's virtual and remoting in and we want to get information from them so we can improve. And then we also want to talk to them about how they can continually improve in their practice and, and kind of make this a nice debriefing and a nice coaching session. Um, and so we anticipate the exams are probably going to be a little lengthy, but we want to we want to make sure that we cover all of our bases with everyone. All right, here we go. So our kickoff is October one. Um, although we've already started today with our first education session with uh, with our uh, spoke hospitals, but we're looking to in October we want to kick it off and get going and start consulting. So that's really fast. So how do you want to, how to become a TELUS Health SANE consultant with us? Well, here we go. This is what you're here for, right? We're initially, we're looking at at least starting with 10 people. Um, we will continue to grow and add consultants as the program grows, as TextTrack grows. But we know we want to start off with at least 10 uh, expert forensic nurses to serve as our uh, telehealth consultants from the back. We want, we'll need to fill a call schedule that's 24 seven covered. Uh, and then we will, as we grow, we know we'll, we'll get exams at the same time. So we need to make sure that as we grow, the number of consultants grows and we're able to meet the need and meet and, and be able to meet all of our customers needs. Um, what do you need as a forensic hub nurse? Well, high speed internet, reliable is good. Uh, because, you know, it's, we need you there for the entire examination. Um, we can uh, have somebody, if we need to, have IT come and visit and talk to you about internet services or upgrade suggestions if, if you feel that that's, that's going to help. Um, we need a private, quiet room with a door for consultations um, so that you can shut yourself off as the consultant that you know, again, we're protecting that patient's privacy and that protected health information. We're going to be providing white noise machines that will be placed outside of the room so that if there's, you're at home and you've got the kids or they're doing homework or it's late at night, that no one will be able to hear what you're saying and you won't be able to hear what's going on outside of that room. Um, we want, we'll provide a dedicated laptop that will have our software on it, uh, webcam, headsets, all of that's going to be provided to our hub nurses, our consultant nurses, so that they have all the tools that they need um, in order to be able to provide consultation to our spoke sites. So what are we looking for as a teleforensic nurse, as a forensic nurse uh, who's, who wants to be a consultant? Well, obviously you have to graduate a school of nursing. Um, we would like someone ideally with three years of experience as a forensic nurse and have at least seen 100 patients. Um, that way you're comfortable, you've precepted at some point, um, and you're good at that teaching. Uh, we need someone who can help and teach and to provide guidance to, um, to, to the nurse at the spoke site. Um, we like someone if you've got SANE or CA certification. And if you're bilingual, that's awesome. Um, and if you have pediatric experience, that would be great too, or any telehealth experience as well. So, so those are some of the things that we're looking for in our consultants. Um, you have to have some issue, knowledge about sexual assault. Obviously we do, right? Because we're working in this field, but also to help I, uh, guide our spoke nurses to thinking beyond just that patient there. What about the family? If this is an IPV situation, let's help them think about, okay, is, are there mandatory reporting requirements that we need to make sure that the spoke nurse uh, understands and that they make those notifications? Um, we need to be able to um, empower those nurses at that site, to empower them with confidence and uh, to help restore control uh, to our, with our patients, with their patients there. Um, we need to be able to, again, treat our patients with respect and sometimes, you know, through that telehealth and that virtual presence, we need to make sure that we're there and, 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 and engaged. Uh, we need to be able to adopt team practices, um, mentorship, um, and be able to multitask too. Uh, that's going to be really important um, uh, characteristics that we're looking for with, with our nurses. 
uh, be able to lead, um, be very empathetic, non-judgmental, um, know your privacy laws, understand HIPAA, understand the Texas Medical Privacy Act, and, and that way we can help them make sure that they are following um, those, those, those rules and regs also. Um, so the hub nurses will apply what we, what we are adopting into TextTrack is the Duffy's quality caring model, which, you know, I think a lot of us are already practicing with that, but here's the name of what we're really doing. Uh, you know, we're, it's mutual problem solving. So we're working with others to solve problems uh, and to provide better patient care. Uh, respect is huge and as nurses we already respect our patients, we respect our colleagues and we need to make sure that we exude that through that virtual presence. Uh, need to be encouraging, um, create that healing environment and that's going to be the biggest challenge I think virtually is to create that environment of support and healing and helping that nurse on that spoke site to be able to do the same in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the in the mode, in, you know, in the now with that patient. Um, so for the process, we would like, we want to see people, if you're interested after all of this, which we hope you are, we would love to see your resume or your CV if you will submit that to Sonia by September the 4th. Uh, we are going to go through all of the resumes and we'll be contacting folks for interviews um, around September the 8th. And and then we'll hold some interviews. If selected, we do have two days of training um, on site at Texas A&M. And of course we will be, uh, you know, physical distancing, everyone will have to wear a mask um, and we've got tons of sanitizer everywhere. So we are working within our policies within Texas A&M as we have this group come together for training. And then we'll begin, uh, call will begin on October 1. Um, so that, it, that being attending uh, on September 17th and 18th, yeah, you have to be there and it'll be reimbursed through text track, um, but you've got to be there. Um, we're going to have that initial 10 nurses. And so if you're still interested and you weren't selected for that first 10, we want it, we want you, you know, we, we want you to still stay engaged. And so please keep in touch with us because as we expand, you guys will be our first go-tos to talk to and say, hey, you know, you're still interested. You still want to be a part of this. We, you know, we want you to be a part of this. And because we only have 10, 10 positions right this second um, that is funded for, for us. But as we grow, we will, get, we will be able to do more. Um, I think that's it. That's all I have. I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen. And I think we'll open it up for questions um, and see what questions folks have. So, and I know Dr. Downing and Dr. Zemanik and Sonia and I will be available to answer whatever questions you have. So let us have it. Let us have it. Stacy, um, there was a question in the um, chat box. Um, let's see. Letty, Letty, did you want to ask your question yeah. about the time frame? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, so that, okay. that map that you show the number of encounters that, wait, let me, let me show myself here. Um, that map, um, what is the time for those encounters? Is that the last year or is that a fiscal year? You know, the map, the Texas map, where you have all the yellows and the greens and the reds? Oh, those were the number of cases. Stand by. Yes. Is, was that uh, for like one year? I think that was back in yeah. 2016 or yes. yeah, 2016. 2016. And, and so oh, I have, wow. yeah, I have the uh, numbers now that the, um, the sites actually gave us of what they average on year. Yeah. Um, and so we have a, a better estimate on that now. I'm sure it's a lot more. And it, um, I have it, another it, question. Um, how many um, hubs do you already have? Um, well, the consultant will be the hub. So we'll have 10. Okay. And then we've got four spokes, uh, which are going to be the sites where we're providing service. And we're hoping to continue to expand that into next year and to add to the sites um, each year, two or three, four sites every year, you know, depending on the demand and, and who and who wants. We're hoping, you know, build it and they will come. So that way we can uh, provide service to as many people as we can. As Is it separate from the pool of vendors that we um submitted that paperwork 
a long time ago? Yes. So this is something different? Um, that was built into that. Um, we will have to, if you, we had an, uh, we have an RFQ process. So if you're selected and you have not completed the RFQ process, we'll have you fill out some paperwork, um, probably about September, October. And um, cause you will be responsible for sending your own invoices in every month for us to be able to pay. Cause remember you would be consultants. So and do so, I have to, I guess, do I have to apply again or if somebody's in there? No, no, Letty, you, you've already renewed okay. because you've helped us okay. with other, uh, with other things and you've gone through the RFQ process. And so right. you, you're renewed for another year. So for new folks, the RFQ process, what that is, it's a request for quotes and you provide us a list of how much you would charge per hour for different types of services. And then when all of that is accepted, then um, the, our purchasing department issues what's called a master order to you. And then you are considered a consultant and you will be paid according to what your hourly or your, your rate is. And then um, you, each person, each consultant will have to submit monthly an invoice for those services. So let's say you took call two, two, you know, two nights and you would submit your invoice for call for X hours for, I don't know, 24 hours at whatever rate, $6, I think we're paying $6 an hour. And then that's, we would just double check that with the call schedule and then it would go off and you would receive a check. Um, if you get called, uh, we are paying $60 an hour and then, uh, so if, you, if a case took, I don't know, five hours, you would put, you know, one case at blah, blah, blah hospital, five hours at $60 an hour, $300. And that would be on your invoice for that month. And then we would uh, just, you know, double check everything, check, you know, sign off on it and boom, it goes over to purchase or to uh, accounts payable. And then you would get a check uh, from Texas A&M. I'm gonna uh, jump in and mediate a little bit because we have a couple of questions. So hope Excellent. you raised your um, hand if you wanna ask your question. Um, actually, I think a couple of them got answered already. Okay. But um, I was wondering, I mean, are, are we looking at 12 hour call, 24 hour call? Is that still yet to be decided? Um, and I think they already answered the pay question. That was one of my other questions. I'll just be right <laughs> forward with that and ask that. But I mean, you already, you already answered. Um, I guess that's it. Cause I think you already answered the other okay. Um, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're looking at that's That's one of the things we're talking about right this second call of 24, uh, 12 hour, 20, 12 hour shifts. And if you want to take 24 hours, you can take 24 hours. Um, if you want to take two days of call in a row, you can, or if you want to take 12 hours one week, 12 hours another week, that's fine. You know, our manager, the program manager for forensic nursing will be getting that call schedule together and, and plugging people in so that we have that coverage. I'll, I'll just one jump more, in for a second. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, just, I was just going to say, I was just going to ask, sorry, I was going to add, add to that and ask, um, are you looking um, for a certain number of hours per month or certain number of shifts per month or that type of thing? Yes, there will, there will be a minimum um, just to ensure that we have enough coverage across the, um, you know, the, the 24 hour, um, seven days a week period. We haven't sorted that out yet. Typically it's six, six shifts a month with 10 people what I really wanted to point out, though, is that, you know, we're starting slow, right? We're starting with one site and then two and then three and then four. And so these are not high volume um, areas. So there won't be a lot of cases initially. It'll ramp up. So it's just important to, to have that in mind. The other thing we want, I wanted to point out is that we are paying a little higher than usual for call pay and um, case time. And one of the reasons for that is that we expect you to be, um, maintain a higher speed internet, for example. So we're trying to compensate you for some of those things that you will need to stay current um, to be able to do this. So, so hopefully that's answering some of those questions as well. Carissa. I have a question. Um, what is the hospital staff uh, training at the pilot sites? What does that look like, especially in regards to 
uh, strangulation care and HIV PEP and non-reports? That's a great question. Uh, we're going down there to do the two hour training, which is going to be more than two hours um, with them. <laughs> and so, so we're in the process of building that training now. Uh, we're also doing uh, with the echo sessions today, it was introducing the medical forensic exam to them. And then we plan on building upon that and doing some actual training in uh, at the site. Um, with them about the medical forensic exam, giving them a little bit of hands-on with the kits, uh, going through the exam and their protocols and uh, related to, you know, prophylaxis and strangulation, all of those things. Carissa, I know you entered in the chat uh, about the 12-hour and 24-hour shifts. Did Dr. Downing, Dr. Downing and Mitchell answer all your question? Yes, sorry, I'm a, I have a toddler, so I'm trying to keep myself muted, but yes, oh, they no. answered it. Thank you. It's okay, I'm just running through. Uh, Shelly asked, I would assume those who are selected will need to continue seeing patients in in-person setting. Will this be true? If that is what you want to do, <laughs> we would love that, um, but uh, that's not a requirement. Well, you do have to keep your currency of practice up. So you do have to keep your cert certifications up. And so, I mean, this is, this is considered seeing patients. This is considered, can also be considered precepting as well. So that can help with, um, you know, like the SANE recertification uh, because you are seeing patients and you are, pre you know, you are precepting, you're precepting a provider and guiding them through that examination. So this can kind of help well on those fronts also. It's a little extra added bonus. Teresa, uh, you raised your hand so you can go ahead and ask your question, ma'am. Yeah, I was just wondering, so you had mentioned, you know, in terms of taking the call, it's pretty flexible and you haven't really worked that out. So how do, how do the, um, the, how do the hubs get notified? Is there a pager system? Do they have a telephone? Because I would imagine we can't sit in front of a, t a computer for 24 48 hours and stare at it and wait. So what? No, uh, no. Um, we are engaging with a call center that will contact the hub nurse and let them know there's a case. So, um, so you, no, you don't have to sit there and stare at a, a computer screen for 12 hours. <laughs> and so uh, you can go on about and do some things and then, you know, around the house, whatever. And uh, when a call comes in, there'll be notification through the call center and they'll let the hub nurse know that there is a case and give a, li a little bit of information. And then the hub nurse will log into the system, into the software system to get additional information and to contact uh, the, the nurse at the site, at the spoke site, and then to get the ball rolling. All right, that's all I have in my queue. Does anybody else have any questions that we haven't addressed yet? Um, just real quickly, this is Hope again. Yeah. Uh, there's a conflict of interest uh, if you're on the advisory board to do this, correct? Yes, no, it's not a conflict, Hope. Okay. I have a question. Uh, where are the advocates sourced from? Are they part of the same agency? That is a great question. Nancy, you've been working with TASA on that one. Sure. So we're work, working with TASA. They are uh, subcontracted under our grant. So their task is to develop advocacy at the site. So the OVC wanted to make sure that that was built into the program. So it's a requirement that we have advocates during the exam. So they're working. It's going to be a multi-stage process. So some of these are, you know, rural areas that don't have what we are accustomed to, right, as a full-fledged advocacy program. So initially, there might be some tele um, advocacy through um, San Antonio's center and then slowly gradually over time building those community advocates. We know that having that community advocate is so important, right? Because they know the, com the community and so it's that that's the best model. So we are going to work towards that, but it might, it might be a multi-stage process partly because of the coronavirus and not allowing uh, other outside personnel. So a great question. I just also wanted to throw in that um, one of the things we didn't specifically mention yet, but we're going to have interviews during the interview process 
we will have a Zoom uh, encounter like this, and we'll have you sim simulate an encounter. And that is with the recognition that all of you, you know, have expert face-to-face -face practices, but having a telehealth presence is going to be a different kind of a practice delivery model. So we recognize that the skills that really make an excellent telehealth forensic nurse might not necessarily be the same that make you a great hands-on face-to-face nurse. So that's why we're going to also have a, a built-in little opportunity to show us how you might uh, present yourself during the encounter. Mm -hmm. So you can anticipate that. Any other questions? I do. Yes. Um, what about the documentation? What are we using? What are we going to, is it going to be an electronic medical record or um, who's going to do the, the chart reviews? And my other question is, what is our, our role when it comes to testifying court? Are we going to be subpoena as well? Uh, is that part, has that been factored in? Great questions, Letty. Um, okay, let's start with documentation. Um, we are using the um, documentation that's in the Texas Evidence Collection Protocol, the kit. Okay. And we'll be guiding them through completing that, um, that document and putting it in the kit. We'll also have, a, uh, for three of our pilot sites, we'll be keeping that information and we'll be doing um, QA and QI on those documents also and providing feedback um, also to the hospitals. Mm -hmm. And let's see, did that answer everything with documentation? Yes. Okay, um, then with the testimony, yes, we recognize that a virtual expert in the room may be mm -hmm. subpoenaed to court. <laughs> and, um, and so we know that and we have built in uh, some funding to help pay for that. Uh, we know that that could potentially happen. Um, the information that we'll be keeping, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, um, the information that we'll be keeping um, is going to be really minimal information we, um, related to the patient um, encounter. Um, and so there's going to be, uh, and, and so you'll be there really as an expert. And, uh, and, uh, and so it's, um, It'll just be like any other testimony, but we will mm -hmm. reimburse for travel and pay that hourly salary for, for testimony. Okay, I, I guess I, I'm just wondering about what is our liability responsibility when it comes to caring for that patient. And uh, so we and a new nurse go to court, um, is the weight of the practice on me as the expert, I assume it is. Mm -mm. or no, no. Is it individual that, that that's yeah the weight is on them they're providing the care we're providing just a consultation so okay. we are guiding them and <laughs> saying no you don't stick that swab there you know put it mm -hmm. over here and on you know and then when you package it make sure you get the tape around here you know that and then let's talk about your documentation and maybe let's see how would you word it and try and help guide them into wording it um approach you know so that it does accurately reflect what they saw. Um, we are not going to be testifying as the nurse who provided care. That okay. nurse will, who actually had hands-on patient care will be the one testifying about the care that they provided. We'll be, you know, if anything, we'll be testifying that yes, they met the standard of care. This is what I saw. Yes, I helped her with the documentation. You know, this is what the injuries mean. You know, our expert piece. Are you going to require a feedback from us, from each case? Like, how do they do? What needs to be done? What were the, you know, mm -hmm. strengths and weaknesses? And yes, yes, yes. We want that as well as the sites, the spoke sites. Their man, their champions at the spoke sites are like, yeah, we want to know what we're doing well, what we need to improve upon, and so they're very excited about that collaborative uh, process between us. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I have a few questions to that piggy off of Letty. So should we invest in personal liability, liability type insurance? You are considered a consultant and that decision will be up to you. 
Uh, no. it, it is required though in, with the RFQ. Uh-huh. Yeah, with RFQ, yes. For the ones who already have that, you have to have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question is, what is the process of getting law enforcement approval for exams as the expert or will that be done at facility? Oh, that's a great question, Amber. Um, that will be done at the facility. That will be their responsibility and we can help remind them, you know, okay, hey, you've got to get that approval, make sure they've got the form. If they don't have the form, they need to get you the form. Um, so that's going to be kind of like on our checklist of things that we need to make sure that they do. So that's, again, that's, that's the um, spoke site's responsibility. Hope commented, will we be documenting anything? Do you want to elaborate on that, Hope? Yeah, um, documentate. Yes, we'll be documenting very, very minimal information. Um, and it's not going to be a full exam. We're not going to be documenting the findings. We will be documenting just, you know, Nancy, jump in and make sure that I'm not misspeaking, okay? Um, you know, we're going to be documenting, you know, what's the location of the exam? What time did I start? What time did I end? Um, we haven't decided yet, are we gonna do the case number or are we gonna have some kind of an identifying number so we know in case there's two cases from the same facility um, on the same day, which could happen uh, down the road. So we know who is who, um, who the, you know, what was, you know, what went well, what didn't, you know, so things like that. Um, it's not gonna be, okay, the history, that's the spoke site will document the history, the nurse there will document the history. We're not going to document the history anywhere they're gonna be handling all of that piece. It's a little bit different. Yeah, it's a, it's gonna, it's a little bit different. It's gonna feel a little weird yeah. um, that you're not documenting, you know, as the expert, I should be documenting all of this. And it's like, no, 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 they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. So we will have the ability to watch them as they document and help them. But we also want to be, our role really is to mentor and nurture these nurses in, in their own practice. So our documentation forms are going to reflect their level of experience. So during the pre-encounter that's alone with that nurse, we're really going to be documenting things about their experience, uh, what things we help them with, um, what information they need, um, and make sure that you know they're ready to do the exam. During the encounter, we want your documentation to be minimal, right? Because you want to be focused on what's happening in the exam. And then there's a little bit of post um, encounter documentation. And so not a lot of documentation, certainly not what you know, you're used to because you're going to be there throughout the exam and before and after. It's going to be a long time that you're with that nurse. So um, the documentation you'll do is pretty, it's just for programmatic purposes and helping mentor those sites do better. Yes. Mm -hmm. Carmen had a great question. She asked, will we have in-person peer slash case reviews? And if so, how often? Great question, Carmen. We will have case reviews probably through like some kind of virtual format like this through Zoom um, so that we can go through with the experts uh, and talk about cases and uh, get feedback of, you know, what, what did you feel like went well? What could you know, were there any challenges? And maybe um, your co-experts may have experienced some of those same challenges. So let's see what we can do to kind of work through those. Or are we coming across something particular at one facility that maybe we as, as administration need to address with that facility about certain things? And so there will be reviews, uh, case reviews. We will be meeting with folks uh, with, the, with, the, with the hub nurses together. Um, so there, there will be those types of meetings, yes. Lori asked, how long is the grant for? And I can speak for the OVC grant, which lasts until September of 2022. And Stacey, I think you can go into more detail of the OAG grant. Yeah, the OAG is a, is a renewable contract um, every biennium. Carissa asked, could we develop relationships with the crime lab serving the facility? I know each lab may have specific standard expectations and such. I would love to be able to provide the recommendations or document to notify the lab of my normals. I, that's definitely an option. Again, that's that collaborative practice of working with uh, the crime labs and that is definitely something that we can do. Uh, Amber follow up with her question initially, initially with the law enforcement. Uh, she was talking to this or question about warrants specifically. Will, they, will we walk through reviewing with nurse 
with regards to evidence collection, we will hear history. Oh, are you looking at um, things in terms of like testimony, um, testimony prep? Um, because yes, we can, that's part of what we can do is work with that facility if they are subpoenaed to court and help prepare them for testimony. Chris, the stage, as I hear you describe this, it reminds me of the attending physician role working with a resident physician at a teaching hospital. Does that sound close to the expectation for the role? Yeah, that's a great question, Carissa. Uh, yes, yes, you're kind of, yes, you're like the attending physician, but you're the attending nurse, the expert, and you're guiding, uh, you're, you're guiding them um, through that, um, at that exam. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Amber's like, she's referring to evidence collection with a search warrant. Um, yes, we will have to walk through them about that. Yes, we will, we will help them through that process if there is any kind of evidence collection like suspects or if there was a warrant, some, yes, we'll be expected to do that. Mm -hmm. Teresa, I see your hand is raised and you can ask a question now. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, that was an accident. Oh. <laughs> Hope, did you have a question? Your hand was raised as well. Yeah, I just, um, going back to the documentation thing. Um, so I'm guessing that our documentation will be on the computers that would be assigned to us if we're selected yes just because yeah michael morton we don't want anything on paper that's discoverable that type of yada yada right mm -hmm. okay just double checking all right any other questions that now ladies all right well, we are over six o'clock. It's a little bit after six. Thank you guys so much for joining us and we appreciate your time and we're not going to keep you anymore. But yes, if you have other questions, feel free to contact and reach out to us and we'll in, uh, answer them individually. We appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you guys um, on the hub in. <laughs> Nancy, <laughs> any, any final words, Kim? Yes. Thank you for being here. It's very exciting to see that you uh, you're interested in this. Thank yeah. you guys. Good yes, stuff. Thank you. Kim? Thank you so much. Uh, no, that's it. Mary had a question about thank uh, you. physician care and medical screening, but we can give her that answer later. Oh yeah, they'll or, be required to do that. Yes, that's they'll have to handle that just like in Tala, you know, just like they would any other patient. Yeah. All right. Okay, guys. Well, thank you. And guys, is tomorrow night just another session like tonight? Or it is. is it? Okay. Yes, it so is. if we attended tonight, we don't need to attend tomorrow? That's correct. Okay. Unless great. you think of some questions and you want to jump in with questions. But yes, yes, tomorrow night will be a repeat of tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye, guys. It's great seeing everybody. Now, Sonia, if you um, hit record, uh, stop the recording, you can download it onto your.